All right, as everyone continues to log in, there are a great many of you gathered here. We will get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia with Politics and Prose. We're live with Tom Nichols and Charlie Sykes discussing our own worst enemy, the assault from within on modern democracy. All right. As everyone continues to log in, there are a great- You can purchase the book directly from us by following the links we will put in the chat. If you have a question for our speakers, you can use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the screen. We'll move to questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time to get to all of them. Additionally, we're glad to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. If you'd like to enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of your screen. And we do wanna thank all of you out there for being here this evening. We're very grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. And now to the book. Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy is a contrarian yet highly engaging account of the spread of illiberal and anti-democratic sentiment throughout our culture and places responsibility on the citizens themselves. Author Tom Nichols is Professor of National Security Affairs, U.S. Naval War College. He is the author of The Death of Expertise, Eve of Destruction, and No Use, Nuclear Weapons and U.S. National Security. He is currently a Senior Associate of the Carnegie Council of, on Ethics and International Affairs, a Senior Fellow of the Graham Center for Contemporary International History at the University of Toronto, and an Adjunct Professor at the U.S. Air Force School of Strategic Force Studies. He has also been a fellow of the International Security Program at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And he is a five-time undefeated Jeopardy! champion. And as one of the all-time top players of the game, he was invited back to play in the 2005 Ultimate Tournament of Champions. Nichols can be found on Twitter at, at Radio Free Tom, where he is close to half a million followers. And in conversation this evening, is Charlie Sykes, founder and editor at large of The Bulwark, host of The Bulwark podcast, and an NBC, MSNBC contributor. He is also author of nine books, including his most recent, How the Right Lost Its Mind. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Tom Nichols and Charlie Sykes. Thank you both so much. Thank you. So for, the, for those of you that have ever listened to the Bulwark podcast, you'll know this is sort of an ongoing, uh, continuing conversation between Tom and I, that this may be the PG, uh, PG rated version yeah. of all of that. So you know, we just might as well just jump into this, Tom, because I, I think if people are familiar with your winsome, understated style on Twitter, um, they, they probably know some of the things you argue in this book. But okay, the heart of this book though, is the argument that we've seen the enemy and, and he is us. Um, and one of the conventions of American politics is always to praise the American people, the voters, because they are so smart, they are so savvy, uh, they are so committed to institutions. And um, am I right in saying that this entire book is an argument, no, it's not true. Um, you write about the major threat is, uh, to democracy is not Donald Trump, or any political party, it is what you describe as the deeply unserious nature of the country. And you use the phrase, the stubborn childishness of voters. So let's just start right there, because this is how you make friends and influence people, Tom, <laughs> is you basically say, you people, if it's screwed up, you did it. Yeah, um, thank you. And thank you to Politics and Pros. And thank you, Charlie, very much for being here with me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, this was a really hard book to write. And I, I had a piece this morning in USA Today about writing the book uh, because uh, it is hard to turn to your fellow citizens. And I, and I didn't want to do that. Uh, I, I really struggled with this. Uh, it took me a while to write the book. I should tell people that it, those of you that aren't familiar with me or previous work, um, and I talk about this in the book, I, I'm not from a privileged background. I don't come from, you know, a super zip. Um, I grew up in a, you know, in a working class town, in a factory town. And I, as Charlie put it, you know, I really believed 
um, that the, the common voter, the ordinary citizen, you know, we were the backbone of democracy. We are the people that hold the line against all the elites and their nonsense and the college professors, you know, like me and the, uh, you know, the, the writers and the actors and Hollywood and all that stuff. Um, and I still think there's an, el there's an element of truth in that. There's still a lot of truth in the fact the American people are still a great people. And, and, but I think that just as democracy is under attack in other places, the United Kingdom, the mother, the place that spawns the mother of all parliaments, uh, Turkey, Poland, Hungary, India, Brazil, uh, there is something going wrong. And I, I wasn't satisfied with the explanations. And, you know, this is something that across the political spectrum, we, we've, you know, Charlie and I've talked about this a hundred times of what, what's happening? You know, why do people think it's okay to say the things they say now? Why is it that we've become fundamentally hot? I mean, we, Charlie and I both in, you know, came out of, I was a New England Republican. Charlie comes from the Midwestern uh, tradition. I, I have since, you know, we've, we've, we're apostates now who have left. Um, but, you know, we, we really never thought we'd see the day where anybody of any political party says things like, you know, maybe it would be better to be under military rule. Um, which a lot of people in, this, in the United States across the spectrum, young people say, you know, well, maybe military rule wouldn't be so bad. Uh, maybe, you know, un, uh, unlimited human rights aren't so great. Um, you know, maybe we ought to just empower the executive to do anything he or she wants and just tell us what to do. This is really astonishing. And it was astonishing for me because I spent the first part of my career studying the Soviet Union. And I kept saying, well, it's great to study the Soviet Union. They're not like us. And so when this started to happen, I, I, it wasn't satisfying to me either to say, well, it's just Donald Trump's fault or because I think of Trump and this is Charlie and I, we've talk, we talked about this, we can talk about it more. I think of Trump more as a symptom mm -hmm. of a lot of this. Um, and it didn't, it wasn't enough for me to say, well, it's economic anxiety or it's globalization or it's, so I, I did what hopefully good scholars do. And I said, look, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to think up through all of these theories. And I just couldn't get away from the human, and I'll, I'll stop here. I couldn't get away from the human sense that this is because of us, that this is a lack of virtue. And the founders actually talked about this. I mean, John Adams talks about, this is not a constitution for any but a virtuous people. James Madison says, if you know, when asked, how are we going to institute checks and balances? He says, look, if we're not a virtuous people, no checks and balances will matter. He literally says, we are in a wretched situation. Um, and I, I just started to realize that maybe, maybe it's us. Maybe there's something going on um, with us. And the answer, and I'll, we can talk more about this. The answer I came to is 40 years of narcissism and entitlement and prosperity and high living standards have made us really, I think, less stoic, less resilient. Um, the idea that a president in 1960 could say, ask not what your country could do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Nobody asks that anymore. Um, you know, that's, that almost seems quaint now. So I, as much as I didn't like it, and I know how much it would make me friends and um, new admirers across the world, um, I, I decided to go with what I think is the true explanation rather than the convenient explanation, which is this is a this is a lack of virtue in us, and it's accelerating. So th this is what I think is so valuable about your your critique, because it is easy to point at this policy or this elite or this politician or this authoritarian. But you you basically describe a, a crisis of citizenship that that, you know, in, in order to be a citizen in a liberal democracy or, or, or for liberal democracy to survive, you need to have citizens who are both knowledgeable and virtuous. Um, that's the tricky part, because shouldn't we be smarter than we have ever been before? Uh, shouldn't, uh, isn't one of the answers, uh, more education, more information? Um, and and I, I've been wrestling with this for years. And I think part of the problem is that we have a supply problem of so much disinformation, but we also have a demand problem. As you describe in the book, Yes, we have citizens who seek out the disinformation. And that's something that that's that's the problem. So talk to me about all this. Right before we began this, we were talking about, um, you know, whether this was a matter of policy. And you you had referenced uh, the work of Eric Hoffer. And I'm actually reading Eric Hoffer as well. 
who describes it, um, because you don't believe that it's a matter of policy. You don't believe that that, that this is, is created by economic anxiety. So talk about that. What, what, what did go wrong with the American character? And, and, and how deep was this dysfunction in this pre-existing condition in the American character? Um, you know, I, I, I think you probably asked that because you know that all you have to do is tell me that education is the answer to everything and my head right. explodes. Uh, because, you know, I, I want all of my social mobility, everything that I, instead of going to jail, which I easily could have done, you know, by the time I was about 13, um, you know, I ended up going to college. Education was, to, is the, the solution for so many things, but it can't make you virtuous. Education can't make you into a good person. And we now live in the most educated time ever. We have universal high school graduation. We have huge rates of college attendance. And yet we're going through this, you know, civic crisis. So anybody who says, well, it's just a matter of education. Look, it's kind of like, and I, I, I know I've used this metaphor many times. It's like the national um, obesity epidemic, right? And I, you know, as a 60 year old guy with couple of extra pounds on me. I, I can't take shots. But it's people say, well, you know, if only there weren't so many junk food restaurants. And my answer is always, if only we weren't so willing and addicted to eating at junk food restaurants. McDonald's exists. Burger King's, you don't have to eat there every day. People do it because they want to. There is a demand problem. People saying, you know, I just don't care. It tastes good. I like it. It's fast. It's going to happen. And I think, Charlie, you're absolutely right that this demand side um, you know, so many times people have said to me, we should, we should police the internet. Yeah. We should shut down Fox. We should stop, you know, and I'm like, it's not, that's not going to stop anything. That's like the war on drugs. You know, if we just burn enough co cocaine fields, you know, poppy fields and burn enough marijuana farms, people will stop taking drugs. You, that's not the answer. But how did um, we get here? Is it well, because we are too prosperous? Do we have yes. it too good? Are we too free? Do we have more choices? I would never say we're we're too free, um, you know, in in the sense of our civil rights. But I think what happened was that um, we first of all, I think, and this links back to the work I did in the Death of Expertise. After the after World War II, we created and sustained and monetized a permanent youth culture. Americans just stopped growing up at some point. And this, this is within my lifetime. I mean, I remember as a kid, as I'm sure you do, Charlie, there was once a time where grown men, and I'm kind of stealing a line from George Will here, there was a time when grown men and their sons dressed differently. They looked different. They acted differently. Grown, grown men and women did, did not seem indistinguishable from adolescent boys and girls. So there's this, that's part of it. And I think underneath that, we adopted an increasingly um, kind of therapeutic approach to everything, including education, you know, where we just said, are you, we constantly ask each other, are you happy? Are you happy? Are you filled? Life is not about ultimate happiness. It's about fulfillment. It's about connection. Not everything goes right every day. Um, people were able to say, look, I, I have my children. I have my dog. I have my friends. I have, I go fishing, you know, somewhere people got it into their heads that unless you're doing something of magnificent importance, your life is wasted. And I think a lot of that got pumped into kids at school. I think a lot of it comes from the media. Think about something really small. This is not you know, a be all and end all explanation, but think of how many times that there, I, I remember this distinctly from a talk show one Sunday where the, a sec, I, can't, I think it was Tillerson was on a secretary of state and the host turns and says, we wanna know what you think. We're gonna take your questions from Facebook. And I, I was sitting there going, no, I don't want to know what, you know, the, some guy in Oregon thinks about. I don't know what the guy up the street thinks. I, I want an intelligent person to put the secretary of state on the spot, ask well-reasoned and informed questions and make me smarter. I don't need to be a participant in this right now. But that, the constant reliance on what do you think? How do you feel? You know, what's really ironic in all this is that you talk to the average person, they say, no one listens to me. And my answer is always, that's all we do is listen to you all day long. Washington, the media, everyone listens to you all day long uh, in a way that wasn't even possible in 1970, say. And of course, some of that is social media. Some of that is hyper-connection. There's a whole chapter in the book about 
how the distance between us all has become so short that we all think we know each other somehow. Um, but I think that this culture of entitlement, affluence, um, really after the 1970s, and I, I know this is another part that doesn't win me any friends, as you know, Charlie, that I think the 1970s were a far more resource constrained time, um, even worse than the Great Recession in, in some ways. Um, we, we simply got used to the idea that things should be the way I want, that people should do what I want, people should listen to me no matter what I say, and that I am empowered. And I think that's, we're all in this part of it to say, this constant pushing back, of, you know, you can't tell me what to do. It's like the national motto is you're not the boss of me. And you see that with the pandemic now. Hey, you should take a vaccine. It could save your life. You're not the boss of me. You know, I mean, you can't tell me what to do. And I think people find that when people feel like they they don't have a lot of control in, in their lives, they look for things that feel empowering. And it feels empowering to say to a doctor or a diplomat or whoever, I, I'm smarter than you. I'm, I can do this. Um, and, I, and, and somehow we didn't push back on that anymore. We don't so, push back on that anymore. So there, there, is, there is a tension, though. I mean, your, your last book was about, you know, expertise. You mm -hmm. are basically saying that there's a role for expertise and elites um, against the people who say, well, it isn't, isn't the democratic ethos that I am just as good as you, that I don't have to listen to you. I mean, isn't that kind of the push and pull? So here you are. You know, Tom Nichols, you know, elitist <laughs> at the same time arguing knew you were going to save liberal democracy. You know, I, in the previous book, I quoted uh, I quoted C.S. Lewis, um, one of my favorites from the screw tape. Well, of course, Charlie, you know, it's you and I, I was both thinking of this, this quote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you and I both have, share this yeah. love of Lewis yeah. and the screw tape letters. Where Lewis says what people, and I think this very much applies to the book, and I kind of was sorry that I used it in Death of Expertise because I, I almost wanted to use it as a frontispiece for our own worst enemy. Lewis um, points out, he says, and speaking through this demon screw tape, right? And remember, D screw tape's whole thing is to screw people up and ruin their human existence. He says, the really brilliant work has been to turn democracy from a word that denotes a system of government into a word that means I'm always just as good as you in everything. Right. That in what, what democracy and particularly the Repub small r Republican form of democracy means I have an equal vote and I have equal rights. I'm equal before the law in the eyes of the state. It doesn't mean I am equal to you in every way. It doesn't mean I'm smart as you or as pretty as you or as fast as you or as tall as you. And somehow, and, and remember, Lewis writes this around 1952 when he says this, th this kind of addendum to the script tape letters, that democracy has come to mean I'm just as good as you. And what, what Lewis, I think it explains so much about our this resentment, this boiling resentment that tortures people in the 21st century, because Lewis made the point that when you say I'm as good as you and you, you use it to mean everything, you have enshrined at the center of your life a resounding lie. Um, no one is as good as everyone else in every way. And but this is how you got Trump, right? This is how, right. let's, let's talk about it. I mean, we're talking about the threat mm -hmm. to democracy and what's been happening here and the authoritarian temptation. You have a very interesting formulation in, in the book where you, know, you, you talk about the rhetoric of people like Donald Trump and, and the rhetoric of people like Viktor Orban, which is restorative, heroic, hopeful, but the same at the same time, it's also dark, nostalgic, and vengeful. And it's both of those things. So people are looking for meaning. They're looking for glory. They want to be big. Is, is that part of this authoritarian appeal that, that we need to understand that it's both hopeful and vengeful and restorative and heroic and dark all at the same time? Absolutely. And, you know, we're having this conversation today, just before um, we joined here, I saw the clip that the guy who's now been arrested in Washington right. posted, and he said, I'm willing to die for a cause. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, I, this is the cause I'm, I, these are the things he, he basically just said, a cause, like he, he really wanted to, he said, I'd rather be home with my wife. And I'm not making fun of the guy because I, no. I found that tape. I mean, what he did was terrible and terrifying and evil, but I also felt just pity for him where he said, 
I'm ready to die for a cause. And I'm like, no, you don't die for a cause. You, you know, you risk your life for something important and noble and good, but not just something to make you feel like you did something that day. And I think the other thing that really strikes me about that is I grew up in a time, and I keep thinking of people like my parents, where you didn't have to feel heroic to feel like a good citizen. This, this addiction to heroism, and I, I don't think it's accidental, by the way, just to make a pop culture connection here, other than... Um, you know, there are indie movies and dramas and all and kind of the small dramas, but the biggest grossing films in America for 20 years are superhero movies. I mean, that's it. We are yeah, addicted yeah. to we don't we're we all want to be Tony Stark now. Um, you know, those are the biggest grossing movies in America. Those are the ones that everybody goes to see. Um, we don't have any sense of ourselves as I grew up thinking, you know, my if you'd have asked somebody like my dad, and my dad was not a perfect guy. I mean, my dad was not, you know, wasn't going to win father of the year or anything, but you know, it, what was heroism? Well, you get up every day and you pay the bills and you put food on the table and that that's close enough. Um, you didn't go looking around to say, how can I restore the government of the United States of America in some, you know, action movie thing. And we, that is really an adolescent kind of impulse well and, and you see that in january 6th and a lot of this oh, yes. rhetoric so you meant you mentioned your dad you actually tell a very interesting story um of of your dad who was very elderly in 2012 oh, um, right. right the the lead up to the the obama romney election when it was you thought that that obama was going to win i i thought until the bitter end that romney was going to win that but that shows you how clueless i, I am um so to tell me a little bit because you do tell this story right near the sure. beginning of the book um, about your 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 father, who uh, was not, shall we say, um, progressive, ad, 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 advanced, enlightened, race. Yes, okay, enlightened, right? Um, you know, I grew up with a dad who we we jokingly called my father Archie Bunker, as as we did so many working class white men of the seventies and eighties would say, ah, oh, you know, Archie Bunker. My father had no problem. At least I would say he stopped doing it sometime in the nineties. But for most of his life, my father had no problem dropping the N bomb, um, you know, um, racially charged land. I mean, he just, I mean, he wasn't, it wasn't like he had all these racial animosities. He just grew up talking about, he didn't like black people, didn't like Hispanics, didn't, didn't think women, you know, loved my mother, but didn't, you know, he, my father was the old guy that I'm sure everybody knows in this audience who says, why are all the police captains on TV women now? <laughs> Right. You know, like, how come every judge is a woman? You know, that kind of stuff. And yet um, I, I told this story because it's hopeful and, I, and I'm and it's one of the little glimmers of light that I hope will will happen more. Just before he died, he was in assisted living. We're sitting there watching TV and um, he's watching Obama, who he never. By the way, my father, this is one of the guardrails of our society. My father, no matter what he might have thought, you didn't talk that way about the president of the United States, no matter who it was. So he just did. not and I said, you know, Dad, I think um, I think Obama's got this one. I don't think Romney, because we were we're both from Massachusetts. We like Mitt Romney. And my father, to my really surprise, and I'm glad it's one of the last things he ever said. He not he he, he shook his head. And he said, "They're both good men. Hmm. We're going to be fine." Like it didn't really matter to him, you know. He of course he was going to vote for Romney. He's an old white guy, he's a Republican. He wanted to vote for Romney, but he said. Yeah. There, but he just shook, he said, he kind of shook, he said, because that was more important. There was once a time in America where being a good person, a good man or woman was more important than being a Republican or a Democrat. And it wasn't an existential threat. You didn't think that right. the country was going to go to hell if the other guy. So I guess here's, here's the question. You asked the question very early on in the book. How long can this go on? Can America still lecture the rest of the world, liberal democracy? Is there a road back? And and, and this is not singling out your book. This is always the hard part in books like this, isn't it? It's like, we know how bad the problem is. You spend several hundred pages talking about how deep this dysfunction in the American character is. And then you have the, okay, this is what we have to do to fix it. And by that point, I'm going, wow, um, I, if, if there was a voting rights bill we could pass that would fix it, that would be great. If we have an educational pram, that would, that would be great. But if it really is the character of the American public, these things are hard. 
So I guess that is the, the question. How long can this go on? And is there a road back? How confident are you? Well, I'll fess up in public and, uh, to something that you already knew, Charlie. I mean, you and I talked many times over the past year that there were times I was just blocked on this book. I mean, I just didn't know how to finish it uh, to say I had some ideas, particularly about things like military service and constitutional structures that are not monkeying with the Bill of Rights. Um, but I, I have to say that toward the end of the book, I was pretty pessimistic because democracy, and I think we need to think of it this way. Democracy is not natural. It's an act of will. It requires you every day to say, I will be, I am living in a democracy. I am going to be part of a civic community. It's not like it's the oxygen around you. Um, you know, the natural state of most countries in the world for most times in history has been a kind of mildly authoritarian right. sort of, you know, um, monarchy or oppressive government. Um, and so I, you know, when the, when I wrote the book, I remember the early reviewers, of course, the university press yeah. book. So there were, you know, reviewers and my editor saying, so you're not just going to end this by saying, well, pff, you know, yeah. and I, I don't think I do. I mean, I do think at the end there is a bit of moral hectoring because I always think of that as my core skill set. Um, but I, I, I suggest a few things that if we can do them, the things I suggest at the end of the book are actually smaller than giant changes, because I keep saying, if you can do this one thing and cooperate on it in some way, as not even in a, bi, bi, I don't even like the word bipartisan anymore, in an yeah. American way or a democratic or a civic way, then maybe we can start <clears throat> finding ourselves back. Maybe we need to take on small projects of reform that force us to just kind of talk to each other a little more and, and work together a little more uh, than saying, well, you know, we've got to fix the whole, I mean, this is, let me just kind of, we've talked a lot about the Trumpist yeah. people on the right. Let me bash some of our friends on the left here for a moment to say, no, we don't need to rewrite the constitution. No, we don't need to edit the bill of rights. No, we don't need to, um, you know, fundamentally destroy the federalist, you know, institutions of the United States government, because that won't work either. I do think on the one exception I'll make is a voting rights act a new Voting Rights Act. I mean, this is, you know, I I, th I just think it's imperative because I think the Republicans have decided to be a minority rule party. They have literally decided that elections cannot be allowed to happen unless they elect Republicans. But beyond that, the way you get out of this in a kind of longer term way is to, is to make this act of will to say, I care about living in a democracy. And for most people, the thing I keep saying over and over again, and I say this on social media every day, when people say, what can we do? I'm like, show up to vote, show up, just show up, just be there. We're still, even in the worst danger we were in in 2020, because I, and I don't know how you feel about this, Charlie, I think we agree on this, that if 2020 had gone the other way, it might've been the last election. Oh, and, uh, and it was close run then. And it was too. close. It was very and close. Yet, and yet we only got 66% turnout and about 49 or 50% youth turnout. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. If you think we're in an existential crisis, then you damn well need to act like it. Well, one of my concerns would be that that with everything that's been happening, um, that the temptation will be for people to withdraw from these obligations of citizenship, that that you're right, that you need to be more engaged. But what I'm hearing from people is at some point you just can't take it anymore. You know, let, let's go to some of the question, the, 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 the questions from from the audience, because I, I think that might help focus it, because. Um, this is, I think, the really hard question. What do you do? What is the road back? Do you go big? Do you go small? If you go big, does it become hopeless? So I guess uh, let, me, let me read you a couple of, this is, this is Donna who, who uh, asked you, uh, Tom, do you agree that part of the problem is the people in power who recognize the lack of virtue in the populace and prey on it by othering immigrants or homosexuals or people of color? Yeah, that's that's you know we live in a time of divisive politics, um, and I think that the Republicans in particular, and it, it is painful. You know, Charlie and I both have to wince when we say this. Charlie, you wrote a whole book about yeah. it. Um, you know, they have. I think that as the ang white cultural anxiety has grown, again, I think a lot of people in Congress have decided, and and at and in governor's mansions and elsewhere in the, you know, in elected posts have decided, 
Um, if, if keeping, keeping people in a constant state of fear and panic is the way I'm going to stay in power, then so be it. Um, what's even more worrisome to me are uh, the people who I really reserve a lot of ire for who know better. And this, yes, you yes. know, the Elise Stefanics and yes. J.D. Vance and Kevin McCarthy and, you know, people who just think they just want to be in Washington. They just like their jobs. They just like living in the Beltway and they don't want at least the Fanics, I think I don't know Stefanik and I don't ever want to, but I think at least the Fanics whole theory of government is I'm never going to live in upstate New York again. I really believe that, um, you know, and I don't want to both sides this because the Republicans are, are worse at it, but um, you know, there, there are divisive people on the left as well who have had tried to keep nationalizing issues uh, and turning everything into a referendum on giant economic reforms or foreign policy. Look, part of the problem is that plays into the hands of anti-democratic forces of both the right and the left. There is a horseshoe problem. People on the far left and the far right have, are adopting positions that are almost indistinguishable from each other now. Um, and this is what happened in Germany in the 1920s. If you look at the parliamentary representation, the center empties out and everybody starts clustering to the two far ends of the parties. Um, so Donna, I guess my answer to your question is I'm in heated agreement with you. Uh, but I, I also think that, um, appealing to people in the center is something that the democracy coalition has to do. And I don't just, I just don't, uh, Joe Biden is doing it. Thank God. Joe Biden ran a completely centrist campaign and yet was a totally attacked for it by people, even in his own yeah. party. And I think part of the reason the Republicans are going so ape right now is they can't find a thing that they can really hang on Biden about nativism or race or any of those things. But it doesn't mean they're not going to try. But yeah, a- absolutely. This is, Charlie, it goes back to your point. We're in a post-policy world. Right. We don't argue about tax rates. We don't argue about, right. you know, local control or federalism or any of that. We, we argue about whose team is going to be in charge. And it's got to be my guys. You know, what's, what's, what's interesting, and it's the, is the role of religion playing in American politics. Um, and I remember after 2020, you know, saying to some of our liberal friends that, you know, look, you need to understand the role of religious liberty, um, the passionate support by evangelicals for what's going on here. But it still remains one of the most extraordinary things that I've ever seen watching, for example, as this debate over refugees plays out, um, that evangelical Christians are the group that is least sympathetic to opening doors to refugees, which to, to being Christians. Of, there's a big difference between being, you know, a Christianist and being Christian. But this is this is also where, um, speaking of othering, the obsession with blaming immigrants for the pandemic, the obsession with walls, none of that's gone. I mean, and I think your your book makes makes the point. If, when Donald Trump leaves, I mean, if he just vanished tomorrow, um, you know, if Mar-a-Lago was was you know just disappeared into a huge sinkhole, these problems would not go away. You would still have um, you would still have the same political class to figure out how do we rile people up? How do we make them afraid of the caravans, afraid of, of refugees, afraid of other people coming to take your stuff? You know, I, first of all, I'm going to steal that word from you because you're absolutely right. The difference between Christianists and Christians, because not one mind. thing I, I wish people would stop doing is assuming that all Christians in America and all and all conservative or centrist Christians are evangelicals. I'm Greek Orthodox. You know, like I'm one of the invisible Christian religions, you know, I'm Eastern Orthodox. And um, you know, the note that it bothers me that the political evangelicals have cornered the market on the label Christian. Yeah. Um, and it's become a shorthand for anybody who's not me. You know, for Sam and, and what's really interesting, the Trump voters who were most likely to describe themselves as evangelicals were also the least likely to have reported going to church. Yeah. They were not actually churchgoers. Uh, and there is this kind of madness about using Christianity as a kind of catch-all to mean white, rural, uh, whatever. But I, I really would plead with people that is there are a lot of Christians in this country, and that's not, you know. And I and this is addressed to our friends on the left who bristle immediately at the word religion. This is not about religion. This is about a particular kind of nativist religion that has taken root and has festered among evangelicals uh, for a long time. I, I will say that when I was a Massachusetts Republican and I was working, and then I went to work for John Hines of Pennsylvania, who was a very centrist Republican in his day, 
um, I felt no common cause with the evangelical right. Right. They even hated Reagan. I mean, people forget this. But by 1984, the evangelicals felt that Reagan had betrayed them because, we, you know, abortion was still legal and kids weren't praying in schools and we didn't have, you know, mandated prayer hours and all that stuff. Um, and I think we're going to have to find a way. A part of this reconstruction effort is that people of goodwill, whether they are people of faith or not, are going to have to find common ground without religion becoming this lightning rod between them because of the, the way it's been hijacked by a particular group of, of people. And I'll say one other thing, Charlie, yeah, sure. the, the collapse of, you know, one of the things that a lot of the Trumpist kind of super rightists have really been upset about, they think that America is just attacking their faith when what they're really upset about is their kids won't go to church. That's what's really got them, that church, their church attendance is declining, their faith is weakening among them, and they want to put that, as all authoritarian movements do, they want to scapegoat somebody else for what may be happening. I talk about this in the book about, you know, kind of the Midwesterners who don't understand, you know, why is my daughter, you know, why is my granddaughter flashing her boobs on the street and, you know, dropping F-bombs? Well, it's not because of the cultural elite somewhere else. It, it's, it's, because of, it's because of you. It's because of how you ran your communities. Well, it, it, it's also that they are apparently willing to trade off the ability to say Merry Christmas, that if you can say Merry Christmas, you can turn your back on refugees and strangers right. and poor people. Right. So you don't actually have to have the content. OK, so here's a question from Dan. I think this is an interesting one, because you were um, ascribing some of the American character to our prosperity and our narcissism that we've you know, basically have too much stuff. He says, how does that thesis carry over to countries that have not experienced a similar long run of prosperity like Hungary and India. So, but they, but they have India, uh, you know, is, I mean, India is an incredibly poor country, but the it's it, amazingly, a lot of what Modi's doing is based on religion, not on class warfare. It, it's just a matter of riling people up again. It's the same playbook. And I think I'm glad you brought up Hungary uh, because um, one of the things I point out in the book is that Hungary, we talk about the Gini coefficient, right? Inequality. And we should talk about inequality for a moment. You know, inequality is what drives all this anger. Hungary ha is a very equal system. There is not huge inequality in, in, in Hungary, and yet it has Orban. It's, it's partly, it is the affluent, peaceful environment in which we live, and it is the, at being uh, hijacked by political entrepreneurs and charlatans. You know, what, whenever you think that this is a, and inequality is a real problem. Inequality is an economic problem because it concentrates too much money at the top, suffocates job creation. It does all kinds of bad stuff that I think we can all, even conservatives and free marketeers can agree on. We don't want to live in a country where, you know, there's a Parthenon and then nothing. Um, but the, what's, what I found interesting in doing the research for this book is that most people direct their resentment not at the super rich, because they don't know what that means. Yeah. They don't know what it means to have a trillion dollars. They don't know what it means to be Jeff Bezos. They just say he's really rich. Once you've gotten beyond 10 yachts, nobody knows how to really operationalize that. The people they're maddest at are the people closer to them in income who seem to have more than they do. Like, you know, like I talk about in the book about the HGTV effect, right? Where people sit there all day and they watch HGTV and they say, well, how come that 28 year old office manager is picking out granite countertops. I can't do that. And they don't, they don't understand this is all kabuki. This is all nonsense. Um, and then they go on Zillow and they start pricing their house against somebody else's houses. And they go on Facebook and they look at vacation pictures and they are driving themselves insane with resentment aimed at other people in their class, which is even more dangerous because then it's just a war of all against all. People hating rich people is as old as time. People hating people that are just a little bit richer than they are, that's really a dangerous and, and kind of soul-crushing thing. Right, here's a really good one from um, somebody who is uh, an anonymous attendee um, regarding the, the, uh, the action figures that you were talking about, the, the superhero movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems akin uh, to this that billionaires no longer build libraries and such but race to space very publicly that, that really even our billionaires have become large children. children. <laughs> yes. Children. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know who asked that question, um, but what a great question and what an incisive observation that, you know, when you, I, I, I remember thinking, and maybe this just shows my age, 
you know, what if I won the Powerball? They actually sold one of the biggest Powerball tickets in history at my stop and shop in Newport, like where I used to do my grocery shopping. I was like the day after I was there, you know, somebody bought the winning ticket, right? And I said, what would I do with, you know, $600 million aside from hiring security to make sure that nobody kidnaps my family for ransom, which is what apparently all rich people have to do now. Um, I thought, boy, wouldn't it be fun to just set up a foundation and give money away? Like, wouldn't it be great to just sit there and say, give me really worthwhile projects, you know, build a library, endow a a charity university, um, to renovate an entire neighborhood that has been devastated or something. And instead, that's absolutely right. Guys say, I have a trillion dollars. What do you do with a trillion dollars? Well, I think I'll build myself a rocket ship like I'm nine (laughs) and I'm still wearing footy PJs. And, you know, with, with Buck Rogers posters on my wall, I mean, it's, it's incredible. And yet, let me just point something out, going back to your point, Charlie, about the demand side. Why? Because we love it. Because we watch it and we applaud these figures and we think it's just so cool and we all want to be like that guy. We don't want to, and the same thing is true in the world of, of places like sports, right? We don't want to be Ted Williams anymore. We don't want to be the guys that went off and were fighter pilots in Korea and then came back and played baseball again. We want to be blinged out, super rich athletes. And it's, it's, it's a childish culture. All right. So here's a question from uh, Janet Lawrence. Um, some of our fellow citizens seem to have moved en masse through the looking glass of actual reality. Even if the pundits and grifters don't really believe the craziness, there is an increasingly scary and growing group who seem to be dug in. Think, do you think that QAnon, I mean, so think, I'm sorry, think QAnon and Mike Lindell. Mm-hmm. Here, and here's, here's the money question. Is there a way to reach them anymore? I don't know. I, I you know, there's a part of me that says no, um, but people do leave cults. Um, uh, let me talk about the why and then maybe what, the what uh, to do. I think the why is, again, it's this response to boredom. You know, Hoffer, Charlie, you got the book right there on your desk, right? Yeah. Hoffer says, no more dangerous thing for a, ma- for a country to suffer from a mass movement than if this population is just bored out of its mind because they just want life to be interesting. And, you know, in my father's time, my, even in my childhood, life didn't have to be interesting. You were just too busy for that. You know, but like, well, like why didn't people, when I grew up, have all this, spend all this time staring at conspiracy theories because they were too tired, because they were too busy. They just had stuff to do. They had to go to work, they had to mow the lawn, they had to walk the dog, they had stuff they had to do. So that's the why. I think it's like, I can't endure a life that is not interesting and fast paced and drama packed. My, and this is gonna sound counterintuitive, but I've said many times, we need to stop paying attention to these people other than whether, than other than, to verify whether they're security threats, like the guy that went to the Capitol today, other than, you know, the FBI, if your neighbor says, hey, I, you know, I, I believe in all these conspiracies and I want to kill Joe Biden, you should probably make a phone call. But otherwise, I think that the way, and I, I know this is going to sound like the way you talk to children, but the way you deal with this is to say, I'm not going to engage on this. I'm not, because it's attention seeking behavior. You know, it's, it's saying, listen to me over and over again. And when you finally just say, look, I'm not going to talk about it. It's not, it's not true. You know, it's not true. Um, I think that actually does snap people out of it a little bit. So this is, this is one of your, uh, this is one of your, um, what is the, 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 the flash, the flash points of the Tom Nichols world um, that, you know, there, there are people who would write like for national review that we need to be more respectful uh, and deferential to people who don't believe the science about vaccinations. We need to listen to them because um, if we disdain them, they won't listen to us. They won't engage with us. So we need to reach out. You, I think, are the uh, the strongest voice saying, no, there comes a certain point where if you're part of the we are the storm, all of this stuff that you don't engage with them. So right. what, what is the alternative to engagement and respect? Um, you know, first of all, the guys at places like National Review who are saying be respectful and get they're just pandering. They're just pandering to their audience. They're pandering to the politicians who pander. They are pandering to their donors. Let's face it. We know, we, we know how this ecosystem works. They're pandering to people uh, so that they don't get, you know, they don't end up like the guys at the Weekly Standard getting chloroformed by a rich donor who doesn't like them anymore. Um, you know, this is, this is the tension Charlie brought up between 
you know, I, I'm, I'm the kind of son of the working class who wants everybody to vote. And yet I have this elitist kind of ignore the crazies approach. I, I think it's stoicism and treating people like adults. I think when you say you have to respect them and understand them and listen to them, that, that's paternalistic. And I've, and I've challenged some of our conservative friends on this many times to say, stop talking about them like they're three. Stop talking about them like they're five-year-olds who think, you know, uh, that Superman can fly. Stop, stop being paternalistic. Talk to them as adults to say, listen, I know you think that Hugo Chavez reached beyond the grave to send Italian satellite controlled voting machines. You're wrong. That's ridiculous. And I'm t- you're a grown man. I'm a grown man. We're not having this conversation. It's, be- it's beneath both of us. And you would be surprised how often that I, I've done that actually in real life with people who have tried to engage me on this. And they kind of, they're kind of stunned for a moment that they're being treated like responsible adults and they have to treat me like a response. They have to respect me as well. No, I'm not going to sit. I'm not a sounding board. I'm not a mirror. I'm not here to be your audience for your nuttery. You want to talk about this? Talk about it with somebody else. All right. Christopher Flaherty has has a, a really provocative question here. He says, do you feel that this culture of narcissism and the desire um, for individual heroism that you that you mentioned leads to or at least exacerbates a um, I want to make sure that I, I get the, the words right, a hyper valorization of the military and of veterans? Or is this symptomatic of something else? Now, you work at the War College, so this is your world. I kind of wondered about that myself. And I, I say that as somebody who has worked very, very hard to honor veterans. Uh, you know, here in Wisconsin, we raise money for the honor flight to send World War II veterans. But so what is this play, this, this sort of fascination, the, the sort of Trumpian porn of Donald Trump being, you know, holding an AK-47 while he's riding on a tank and how the military is going to save us all? What do you think? Well, uh- a couple of things. First, I just, to, to complete a thought from the thing about understanding them, uh, when people say, well, if you don't, they're going to be angry and they're going to do bad things. And my answer to that, by the way, after five years of this is, what? how could it be worse? They've already tried to lynch Congress and burn the Capitol. So I'm sorry, but this is where coddling and understanding have gotten us. I, I think in 2015, and, and you know, as Charlie can tell all of you, Charlie and I were inundated with, look, don't rile them. Yeah. They'll just vote for Trump. Well, it, did, it didn't make any difference. And I think we overestimate the control we have over people like that in, in those terms. Your point about the military, Christopher, um, I, and this is where I have to say, I don't represent the views of the Defense Department, the Navy, any sane person other than me and my cat is around here somewhere. Um, I know everybody wanted to see Carla. She came in and left. Um, I actually, I I deal with this in the book and I call it, I I am totally with you on this about it's become a sickness in this country to engage in this hyper valorization of the military. And in the book, I call it the new Spartanism Mm -hmm. that we have basically turned the military into Spartans because I think some of it's our guilty conscience about outsourcing security and the difficult hard things to volunteers. One of the things I'll say after years of working with the military, most of them are not comfortable when you say thank you for your service. They, they're like, no, no, it was my honor to serve my country. They don't want to be thanked. This is us. I, I think as always is the case when there's a civil military dysfunction, it is almost entirely on the part of the civilians. But I think we have created a military culture where there is a, a streak of military opinion that says, We are the last guardians of the American state. And everybody, you know, if you haven't put on it, this is like Starship Troopers, right? If you haven't put on a uniform, you're not a citizen. You don't have a right to speak. Um, We went through that after Vietnam, to some extent. We went through it somewhat after the first Gulf War. I worked in Congress at that point. Um, But I think mostly that's on us. And I I don't like things like, I I bristle a little bit, not because I, I don't love veterans, and I work with officers and enlisted people all day. I mean, I love the people of our military. I, I respect them greatly. But when I see someone with a license plate that says, veteran, this was the war I was in. Here's my decorations. That feels weird to me. That feels Soviet. The Soviet Union, people used to wear their decorations on their jackets. You know, the old men of World War II, and they'd have their you know Order of yeah. Lenin and their Order of the Fatherland War and so on. My father's best friend, and I'll I'll stop with this story, but it shows you how different a culture we've become. 
he was, he owned a window washing business. And I, I actually worked for him for a while as a janitor. And like, I needed a job. So I, you know, he put me to work emptying garbage cans. And um, he was an unassuming man, good guy, had a, had a lot of bucks from, you know, running this, this cleaning business. I didn't know until he died when I was a grown man that he'd gotten the silver star mm -hmm. for like this saving private Ryan moment where he literally crawls on his belly and wipes out a German machine gun nest single-handedly and saves his squad. Like, this is a big deal. This is like a, you'd make a movie yeah. about that now. He never told anybody, never talked about it. He was, you know, throughout the European theater for most of World War II. And I asked my father, I said, you know, he said, well, he said, yeah, Andy was a hero, but he said he just didn't, they didn't talk about that. Um, and you didn't put it on your license plate. You just got back to, and when he came back from the war with a silver star, he went back to washing windows and running a cleaning business. And um, we're just not that people anymore we because we've people. created a permanent class of warriors that we rely on. And that through our guilty conscience, I think that we constantly, I think one of the things that is the best thing about our military is that almost in, almost inevitably that most of the military people I've met, they're like, don't, don't do that. Don't, you know, not, you don't need to say, thank you. I'm, I'm a citizen too. Um, and I think that's mostly on us, but I, Christopher, I agree with your question. I think that's a dysfunction in a democracy to glorify military service to the point where we have. And I think that's on us. I think that's on us civilians. So, uh, Peter Davis Jr. asked this question. So where do you come down on the issue of national service, expanded AmeriCorps? How, how do you restore the sense of citizenship? Um, do you have a position on that? I, at the end of the book, I have one of these small recommendations where I talk about a summer of service and I don't want it to be AmeriCorps. I don't want it to be picking up litter by the roadways because I think we've turned those into like paid internships and kind of summer jobs that kids should be getting anyway. Um, I think it'd be great if every kid um, sometime between 17 and 21 had to spend five or six weeks like living in a barracks and learning how to climb a rope and handle a gun once in your life. And because I think that would end, I actually ironically think that would end a lot of the romance with guns. Like the people that are least in love with guns, in my experience, are people you have to work with them all day and handle them. Um, and so I think some kind of ironclad commitment to be part of the ready reserve of Americans who could serve. Because that also means being a little more physically fit. It means having to do things you don't want to do and get yelled at by somebody that's an authority over you, even if you didn't like it. We, we've lost all that stuff. Um, and, I, and I think we need to get that back. Do I think that proposal will fly? Probably not. But it's a small thing that if both parties in this country really want to do it, they could probably create something like it and make it happen. So Marlene Real has a question. I I'm, I'm apologize by not pronouncing the name right, uh, R-E-I-L. Um, much of what you are discussing, resentment, arrested development, seem more in the purview of psychology than politics. Why do you think that psychologists are not sought after on the same shows that you both frequent? <laughs> well, I mean, and, you know, really I, that is part of the problem is that we're trying to deal with this as a political problem when really a lot of it is a psychology problem, isn't it, Tom? And actually, Charlie, I thought Marlene was going to ask me, and aren't you violating your rules on expertise by psychoanalyzing the country when you're a political scientist? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, okay, um, guilty, because I, I'm a social scientist. I study large trends. I study societies as a whole. Uh, you know, we do talk about things like national culture in political science and, and so on. Um, I think one reason, and I've actually talked, I did seek the advice of psychologists when I, when I was working on this and with the death of expertise. Psychologists don't want to be drawn into the political fray. They don't, you know, there was this group of psychiatrists you may have seen a couple of years ago that wrote a book about Donald, basically where they, psych, they, as psychiatrists, they said, Donald Trump is basically not sane. I was not supportive of that effort. I'm, I think the Goldwater rule is there for a reason that you shouldn't, you know, psychiatrists who need to be the healers uh, and the unbiased, you know, caregivers um, shouldn't just wade into this. And I think one of them actually lost her job because she just wasn't going to take no for an empty. She was at Yale, I think. Um, but I don't want to misquote what happened because I think at some point you say, Hey, I'm a doctor. I've determined that this guy is not fit for service. Um, sorry, but the, in the end, the American, there's no constitutional requirement about that. You, you can't, if you can't convince other people 
then you can't rely on your authority as a medical professional to say, I demand now to be, you know, get a veto on this. Um, and I think one of the reasons too, that they're not sought out about this is because psychologists, uh, they're, they're not social psychologists, which is a different category. So there aren't that many, I, in the, in the death of expertise, I talk about the Dunning Kruger effect right. of people being thinking the dumber you are, the smarter you think you are. That was established by social psychologists. Um, but it's not just psychologists. You'd need social psychologists and, you know, working with other social scientists. And I, and I think most of them just aren't working on this kind of problem and don't want to be dragged into this as a partisan weapon uh, against any one side. And I, I kind of get why they do that. And I support that. So th this, I think, is going to be our last question. We'll, we'll end on this kind of high note. Uh, Don um, asks, hi, uh, Tom and Charlie. Love, love of the work uh, both of you are doing. The reason I do that is Tom's writing and the Bulwark provides uh, data and arguments that cause me to change my mind. And here's the question. Oh, that's is a nice there, thing there. Is there any political coalition to speak directly to those of us that are interested in changing minds or making informed trade-offs to preserve democracy? I mean, Tom, you've conceded that the center can be a lonely place mm. right now. So are you and I just the, you know, orphans wandering around in the political wilderness? Is there a reason to believe there's a political coalition that will speak to people that want to address the questions of democracy and citizenship? I, I think we're actually the biggest political movement in America. Hmm. We just don't, we're just not activists. We don't spend a lot of time reaching out to each other and saying, hey, let's be enraged centrists. By our nature, that's not what we do. Um, you know, most people, because also we, we don't agree about everything. We're not a church. We're not a religion. We're not a cult. Um, you know, even Charlie, you and I are alike on a lot of stuff. We could probably name a half a dozen things right now that we would fight about if, if this were a normal political environment, even though we're both right of center. We, we disagree about a whole bunch of stuff. Dogs right? versus cats. Do well, I think that has been settled for all time by my cat. Although your dogs are awesome. They've made a good They're run here. on Twitter. Your yeah. dogs are very yeah. attractive animals. Um, but I think one thing that, that you can do, it's not necessarily being a movement. I think one thing that people in the center need to do is to serve as good examples to the other citizens around you, you know, to, to make it a point to say, yeah, I, I voted. No, I'm not having crazy conversations. Yes, I am informed about things um, because I think too many of the people in the center keep and, and I realize that Don didn't ask this question this way. They say, well, how can I get out there and really get these people to understand? And I think the, and I, I don't know how to do this as much as I think I do. Make those folks want to be more like you instead of telling them to be less like them. If that makes any sense, be the adult in the room. Um, and that is in a million social interactions every day. It's about things like politeness, civic behavior, a general, you know, well, pleasantness to your fellow citizens. Um, you know, I, I, what's really interesting to me, and I'll, I'll kind of see if I can wrap this up with a, a metaphor or an image. You know, when you're on the highway and you pass somebody with all the flags and the Trump flags and the mm -hmm. stupid bumper stickers and the hang Joe Biden stuff. Every time I pass that guy, and there's a lot of them, they're even here in New England. You know, they know they're looking like idiots. They know they're wrong. I mean, I've, I've said this, Charlie's heard me say this a hundred times in their heart. This is the old uh, rip off of the old Goldwater slogan <laughs> in their hearts. They know they're wrong. Yeah. And arguing with them just confirms them in that wrongness because they dig in. It makes them feel good. It's a, it's a, they want the emotional energy of arguing over it. And that's why they're doing it. They're driving down with all this nincompoopery flying off their trucks and they're going, come on. Give me a dirty look. I dare you to argue with me. Tell me, you know, and instead, just keep driving, saying, here's my plain blue car with, you know, um, here, I'll let you in. Go ahead. You need to take a left in front of me, please. Uh, and I think that that's how you begin. And you know what? I will agree. I know a lot of people out there are saying, boy, that doesn't sound satisfying. But you know what? It's never satisfying to be the adult. It's, it never feels good, but somebody's got to do it and it's the right thing to do. Agree. Thank you both so much.
I could not agree more. And to end on a positive note and a forward thinking note to keep driving like that. Uh, many thanks to Tom Nichols, Charlie Sykes, and our audience out there for all of your engaging and thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this important programming. And of course, we couldn't host these events without the book sales to support it. So go ahead and follow the link in the chat to get your copy of Our Own Worst Enemy, The Assault from Within on Modern Democracy, or you can visit us at politics-pros.com. Feel free to check out our events calendar for everything else we've got coming up this fall. It'll be a good one. And from our shelves to yours, we hope everyone out there is staying safe, staying strong, staying civil, and of course, staying well-read. And we will see you next time. Thank you both again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.